Good morning. <laughs> I'll try it again. Good morning. It's so good to see everybody this morning. Beautiful, warm day. Uh, <clears throat> we're excited that you're here. We uh, are going to come together in just a minute and, and pray together. We've got a lot of stuff going on in our lives. Uh, summertime, school is out. School's about to start. Woohoo. Uh, yeah, some of the parents are like, yes. Some of the kids are not so much. Are you excited? Yeah, Annalise is so excited too. School's starting. <laughs> it's uh, it's a great day. It's a great day. It's a great day to gather together. Uh, let's pray together, and then uh, we're going to worship together. Sound good? All right. Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you so much for uh, today and just the opportunity that you give us to to come together to worship you. Uh, God, we pray that you're glorified in our lives. We pray that you're glorified in our worship. Um, God, we pray that you're glorified as we uh, dive into your word, learn more about who you are and what you're about. Um, we just thank you for today. And God, There's so many things going on in our lives and uh, different distractions, but Lord, for the next hour or so while we're here, I pray that our focus can be on who you are and what you're about. And we love you, we praise you, in your son's name we pray, amen. Good morning. If y'all stand, we'll worship. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Forgiven, singing redemption song. There's a fire that burns inside, a fire that burns inside. Nothing can stop us. We'll be running through the night with a fire that burns inside, a fire that burns inside. We are the free, the freedom generation. Sing in a mercy. You are the one who set us all in motion. Yours is the glory. There's a fire in our heart and it burns for you. It's never gonna fade away. We are the freight and yours is the glory. Oh, 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 oh. the risen living alive in you and our passion will not die no our passion will not die nothing can stop us we'll be running through the night and our passion will not die no our passion will not die we are the free the freedom generation Sing in a mercy, you are the one who set us all in motion. Yours is the glory. There's a fire in our heart and it burns for you. It's never gonna fade away. We are the freight and yours is the glory. Oh, oh, oh. Up from the grave, up from the grave you rose again, up from the grave you rose and we will rise up, rise up, into the world that you so love, into the world we go and we will rise up, rise up. Freedom generation 
sing in a mercy You are the one who set us out in motion Yours is the glory We are the free, the freedom generation Sing in a mercy You are the one who set us out in motion Yours is the glory There's a fire in our heart and it burns for you It's never gonna fade away We are the freight and yours is the glory oh, oh, oh. Y'all awake this morning? You sound awake. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy. Worthy, Lord, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. So uh, you might recognize some songs from last week, but that's okay. This, uh, this series is, is some good stuff that we're going through, and if you haven't been here for, for uh, any of it so far, hold on to your seats. Um, but I love this part of the song. It says, height nor depth nor anything else could pull us apart. We are joined as one by, our, by your blood. And that's something that, that is West Metro I love about this church is we, we are, we're one and we're a family and we can come together. And, and if one's hurting, we're all hurting. So I kind of want to start this, this off this morning um, singing that. I is no death, no anything else could pull us apart. We are joined as one by your blood. Hope will rise as we become more the conquerors through the world who love the world. In the valley, oh God, your need. In the quiet, oh God, your need. In the shadow, oh God, your need. Am I breaking, oh God, your need? Your need, oh. Searching, oh God, your me. In my wandering, oh God, your me. When I feel alone, oh God, your me. At my lowest, oh God, your me. Your me. Oh. You never leave my side Your love Stands firm through all my life I give no death No anything else Could pull us apart We joined as one by your blood Hope will rise as we become more the conquerors through the world who love the world Heights no death no anything else can pull us apart we joined as one by your blood Hope will rise as we become more the conquerors through the world who love the world. Oh God, you never leave my side. Your Side. 
Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed. The series that we're in about reconciled uh, talks about how regardless of what opinions may be, regardless of what society norms may say, God is the one thing that can bring everyone back together. God is the one thing that can bring reconciliation both with Him and with each other. God is the one thing that can bring peace and comfort. Um, Regardless of the status quo. Uh, we reached part of our service where we're going to take up our, uh, our tithes and our offerings. And uh, this is a way that allows us to continually be a part of God's big plan. To continually be a part of God's plan to preach reconciliation. To preach the good news of the gospel. To take the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Whether it's in Yukon at Mission OK or in Ghana at the Pearl House. So if you're visiting with us, I do want to say this. Do not feel obligated to give. We're glad that you're here. We're excited that you're here for visiting with us. Do me a favor. The only thing that we ask of our visitors is to fill out one of these My Waypoint cards. Just put your information on there. Uh, we just want to have a record of your attendance. We might give you a phone call, send you a text message, drop you an email, uh, invite you out to dinner. That's all we ask of you. If you feel like this is your church home, you, this is where you belong, this is where God has called you to worship and to serve, then we encourage you to give from the heart, give sacrificially. You give what God has laid on your heart to give. You'll notice as the offering baskets are being passed around, a lot of our kids will be coming up, some of our adults, and they'll be placing money in our small white pearl house. And that goes to pay for the educational needs of one of our pearls in, uh, in Ghana. By the way, they just finished the new house. They got all their girls moved in and they're settled in. And it's amazing what God is doing in Ghana. And it's even more amazing that he's able to use a church as small as ours to be a part of something so big. So you'll see that taking place as we're uh, taking up offering too. Last uh, Sunday at Mission OK at Britain Courtyard, we had 37 people stuffed in that small apartment. It's amazing. Two of which who were very active gang members. Um, Bloods, I believe. Had colors on. And they were wreaking havoc with the Bible study going on. And it was awesome. Because what happened was the Bible study that was planned was folded up and put back inside the Bible. And we went full-blown gospel. We went full-blown, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We went full-blown, the world has nothing to offer but death and destruction. Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. That's what this offering goes towards is things like that. So I'm going to pray. We're going to take up the offering, and then we'll continue to worship. Father, we thank you for today. I thank you for gathering us together in your church. I know we have a lot of people off on vacation, but we are still here to worship you, and they're, I know they're worshiping you on the road as well. God, bless this offering. Multiply it. Use it. God, bring people to know you, Father. God, bring the lost into the light. Continue to destroy that, that barrier wall, that dividing wall of hostility. Christ, you did it all when you said it is finished on the cross and you took your last breath. God, we love you. Bless this offering. Use us as your tool. Amen. Christ, my sanity. Sweet Jesus Christ, my clarity. Sweet Jesus Christ, my sanity. Sweet Jesus Christ, my clarity. Bread of heaven broken for me, cup of salvation held out to drink. Jesus, mystery. Christ, my sanity. Sweet Jesus Christ, my clearer. 
How y'all doing? All right, that good? All right. I, uh, I, my favorite thing in the whole world is a church that lets me play uh, Prince on Sunday mornings. So some of you are going, where did that come from? It's all right. It's fine. I, 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 I just I miss him. He's, been, he's only been dead a couple months, and I'm still sad. So, um, okay. So uh, we're doing a series called Reconciled, and we're trying to decide how far we can go before we get people so mad that they just don't come back. We started with poverty, we dealt with in force, uh, last week we dealt with our back, it's good, today we're going to talk about women, I realize I'm outnumbered, 51% of the population, uh, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about reconciliation, what is a kingdom that is seeking to reconcile the gospel to the world look like, and about what a no compromise position and response to that would look like. We said, well, what are the biggest things that are uh, that bring about division in our world? And we talked about economics. We talked about race. Uh, we talked about what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to deal with homosexuality and transgenderism. Many of you are like, I want to come back and see that. So you can be here next week. Um, but one of the biggest issues that we face. Uh, in our country is the divide, in the world, is the divide between men and women. And this one's old, all right? We talked uh, last week, uh, John traced 
uh, racism all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 with the Tower of, of Babel. I could take this one to Genesis 3, all right? So I win. Ha ha. John, if you're watching, I win. So, uh, and John's like, yeah, whatever, sucker, you don't win. So uh, next week we're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, so I'll win again, and I'll, I'll just continue anyhow. So um, if you really want to start looking at the history of the conflict between men and women, you've got to go to Genesis 3. Uh, and some of you are immediately going to get all prickly, and you're going to be like, yeah, you're fixing to blame Eve, aren't you? Nope, sure not. Not going to do that. But as we look at some of what we're going to look at this morning, you're going to realize the effect that that had on the, on the views of the relationship between men and women as we go through the history of the world and the history of the church. Because the truth of the matter is, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve are in sinless perfection before the serpent and the fruit enter the picture... They are existing in harmony. It's a good life. It's uh, naked in the garden of God. I don't think I could think of anything better than that. Some of you would prefer a Hilton, uh, and I get that, uh, because you're like, I'm not an outdoors person, and there were probably bugs, but they didn't bite. And there was none of this oppressive humidity or heat. All right? It was nice. Um, But one of the things that God says to Adam and Eve when he pronounces judgment on them for violating what he said, is he basically says there's going to be this enmity, there's going to be this disagreement, this fracturing of the perfect relationship that was supposed to exist between them. And the end result of that historically, until the time of Jesus, and we're going to show you this morning how Jesus changes this, is that women are largely subjugated and treated as property. Now, I don't know whether you know this or are aware of this or not. If you go back and look and read the history, and ladies, I'm sure some of you are more aware of this than some of the fellas are. So I'm going to do a little education this morning. I told somebody earlier, this could either be the longest sermon I've ever preached or the shortest. I'm not really sure. I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle, so buckle up. But we've got to do some history here, because if you go back and look at the history of, of, the, of females throughout the foundations of the world, what do you see? Women are property. They're bought and sold. They are um, daughters to be given as dowries. They are wives that are supposed to come with property that enhances the status of their husbands. The idea of polygamy comes from the idea of when someone would conquer a country, they would then take as their spouse someone who is from that conquered country, and they would add themselves to that nation. The king or the sultan or whoever would add themselves to that nation by marrying into that family and therefore taking possession of all that the defeated person had. It's ugly. It's gross. To our 21st century American sensibilities, post-Gloria Steinman, post our bodies ourselves, post-feminism, it is this ultimate offense. And yet, it was the way of the world for thousands of years. And truthfully, in some parts of the world, that continues to be the practice. One of the reasons why we work with the Pearl House is because in Africa, and particularly in the, the western region of Africa where we are, Young girls are not valuable. They are seen as a drag on their households. And so their biggest use is to be sold or given away. In China, with its ridiculous one-child policy and its state-enforced abortion mandates, if someone has a baby girl, often those those children are abandoned on a hillside to die of exposure because then they can get away with having another baby and hopefully have a son to carry on the family name. It's sick. I have four daughters. Don't get me started on whether or not women are valuable. I am married to the most amazing woman in the entire world. Okay, sorry, fellas. Mine's the best. So the idea of somehow or another this, this ugly history of women being somehow or another less or lesser really, really, really makes me angry. Particularly when I begin to look at the ministry of Jesus. I want you to turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. We're going to start there. We're not going to end there. We're going to look at several different passages and, and comments and, and interactions of Jesus. So this is kind of how we're going to go this morning. We're going to dig into this passage of Scripture. We're going to do some history to see how the teachings of Jesus were lost. And then we're going to go back to Scripture. And then we're going to draw conclusions from the entirety of, 
of the Word of God. Are we good? Can we do that? All right. So bear with me. Some of you are like, we're going to do history. Yes, we are. We're going to do history my way. Good. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1, says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, which we are pretty sure was Jesus' mom, Mary, went to see the tomb. This is the tomb of Jesus. This is post-crucifixion. For those of you who are not sure where we are, this is after the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. Verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They passed out. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Verse 9, And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, some of you are immediately wondering, well, this is a very odd passage to kick off a, a discussion of God reconciling men and women and, and women's role in the world and all this other stuff. But it, it is only that way if you do not understand the significance of the events. The resurrection of Jesus is the single most momentous historical event in the history of the world. We know that because we base our division of time on his life, death, burial, and resurrection. The designation B.C. and A.C. stands for before Christ. A.D. stands for, and I'm going to butcher it, Abnus Domini, which means the, in the year of our Lord. The resurrection of Jesus literally splits time in two. And the first people to see him are two women. Now, for those of us that live in 21st century America, that is not that big of a deal. Women see stuff all the time, right? But in the first century, a woman was not allowed to give testimony in court. She was not even to be believed. She was not even to be listened to. She was not considered to be a credible witness. Do you truthfully believe that it is by accident that Jesus, who is God with skin on, could appear to anyone who he wanted to as the first witnesses to his resurrection, and that he chooses not Peter, not James, not John, not Bartholomew, not Matthew, not Simon the Zealot, no one else but two ladies? The significance of that is tremendous. It is even more significant that his instructions to them are not go tell John or go tell Peter to come here so they can see me too and then they can go tell everybody where to meet me. He simply tells them, go and tell my brothers. I'll see them in Galilee. What is even more amazing is that they go and tell and where do the disciples go? They take the two women at their word and they go where Jesus sends them by the words of Mary and Mary Magdalene and they meet Jesus there. And yet, today, way too often the accusations that are leveled against the church and by the church I'm referring to the orthodox Christian church those who believe in Jesus and in the Bible. The accusations are that Christians are anti-women, that we are sexist, that we are abusive, etc., etc. The list goes on and on. I'm sure some of you could name those, and you could probably give me ringing examples, ladies, of how you have been mistreated inside of the church. And so before we get to 
what Jesus intended. We've got to talk for a few minutes about how we got there. So, for those of you who are history buffs, this is the part where you're going to have to knuckle down, all right? Can you bear with me for a few minutes? Because I need, I, need I need you to grab this, or what we're going to talk about isn't going to make any sense. Because what you're going to be able to do, if you don't grab what we're fixing to talk about, you're just going to be able to go, yeah, but this is what this says. Or this is what this person said. Or this is what that person said. I need you to grab with me the history of the situation and the history of the church. And I'm going to have to take you all the way back, all right, to the history of the early church. In the early church, we have women serving in the Bible in places of prominence. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, we have a lady who is called a deacon. The word that is used there is translatable as deacon. It means servant or servant leader. If she is in the role that she is placed in inside of the church, it is a role of position inside of the church. It is not some person who is just like kind of over here, kind of meaningly doing whatever. It is a role of prominence inside the church. It is important. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, we have Paul making the case for women serving as deacons alongside men inside of the church. There's been a lot of debate and discussion about this. For me, my mind was settled on this when I was in seminary, working through a hermeneutics class, where my professor began to walk us through in the Greek, looking at the passage and the way that the passage is translated. Many of you will look in your, past, your copies of Scripture and say, oh, no, 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 it says wife. That's just what deacons' wives are supposed to be. But it doesn't make semantical sense in the original language. None. Further, it is, completely separ- it is completely in parallel with the passage referring to elders, who are the per- people who are in authority over the New Testament church in the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd centuries. And why in the world would the wives of elders not be as important as the wives of deacons, and yet they receive no special instructions? So both grammatically and logically, it makes no sense. Paul is talking about women serving as deacons inside of the church. John Christman, whose name I'm going to butcher over and over again, and Origen, two of the early church fathers, name a woman named Junia who is referred to in the writings of Paul as an apostle in their writings, writing less than 150 years after the birth of the church. That's a big deal. That meant that the role of this woman as an apostle was to be someone who was going out and helping to plant churches. That's Tremendous. In Acts chapter 21, the daughters of Philip are identified as prophetesses. If you go to the teachings of Paul in 1 Corinthians, prophetesses and prophets spoke inside of the church with authority, teaching about what it meant to follow Jesus. In the second century, we have extra-biblical evidence of Pliny the Younger, who was a, who was a ruler uh, in, the, in the Roman Empire, who was interrogating two female deacons of the early church. This is recorded in writings, extra-biblically, outside of the Bible, identifying them as women who were deacons inside of the Christian church. The Romans didn't like the Christians. There's lots of records about things that they did to Christians. It's brilliant. Clement of Rome, who is another one of the early church fathers who wrote in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, asserts that women went as missionaries with the initial apostles, not as their wives, but as fellow missionaries. We have no evidence of that inside of Scripture, but this is extra-biblical historical evidence. Much of this was news to me as I did research to plan this. I've never read the majority of this before, other than the statements that are inside of Scripture. Finally, by A.D. 300, a Roman uh, philosopher, a pagan, whose name is Porphyry, P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-Y, I tried, all right, I tried. You try and pronounce some of these names. Writes, criticizing the Christian church because of their allowance of women to have roles inside of the church and of the prominence of women. Christian historians have theorized that the reason for the rise of women inside of the early church is because for them it was much easier to become a professing follower of Christ because they had no social standing inside of Roman society. But for their husbands it was very difficult because to become a follower of Jesus meant that you were denying the worship of the emperor. 
And so for men who were Christians inside of the church, they were less and less prominent in their roles because to do so would have been to admit to be giving allegiance to Christ over the emperor. It came with a loss of social standing, land, finances, etc. And yet many women were converted, and their husbands eventually converted through their witness as well. But because of the social status of the day, it was much easier for women to serve in prominent positions inside the church than it was for men. Once again, all things I've researched and read over the last two or three weeks that I'm like, wow, I had absolutely no clue. Hence the reason this could be the longest or shortest sermon that I've ever preached in my life. So what happened? We have both internal and extra biblical evidence of women being important inside of the church. How do we go from that? How do we go from women as the witnesses to the most important event in human history? And all of these other historical actions and activities to the accusation that is lobbed against Christians today of the church being anti-woman, sexist, abusive, etc. How do we get there? Two reasons. And yeah, I, I researched, I read, I pulled out dusty old church history volumes that I've had for years and years. Um, and I, I could really truthfully only come up with two reasons. The first one is a historical event called the Patristic Age. Um, basically, in the late, the middle to late 300s, there began to become this series of councils that occurred inside and around the church. And it gave, it gave rise to this group of people who became more and more known as the, the later church fathers. And there, because it was still a very male-dominated culture in the, in the secular popular culture, and because there were people like Perfori, or however you say his dadgum name, lobbying all these accusations against the church, they began to grab a hold of these positions that had been largely prominent in, Jewish Christian, in the Jewish beginnings of Christianity of patriarchy. And they began to say that um, women, based upon selected readings of certain texts, such as Genesis chapter 3, were weak. They were easily tempted. They were the source of evil. And, it gets worse, they were lower life forms because they had been created from man. Nice. Most of this is based on their reading interpretation of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. So, as they begin to translate scripture into Latin, the Latin Vulgate, and into other, other languages, as that kind of moved and progressed forward, this idea of this very male-centric view began to dominate the reading and translation of scripture. This, become, this becomes completely and totally laid into a systematized form with the rise of the Catholic Church. Now, if you're here this morning and you're Catholic, this is not my attempt to jump all over you and tell you you're a horrible human being, but this is an indictment of the history of Catholicism. Because with the installation of the Pope, what basically began to happen is women were literally shunted to the side. They had no place inside of the church. And that this, kind of, this idea came from the Christianizing of Rome because of Constantine. And it continued forward as more and more the realm was made completely and totally subservient to the Catholic Church. Of course, we all know what happens to the Catholic Church. Uh, in 1517, uh, we have uh, a guy named Martin Luther who really doesn't want a new church to be, bu to be built because people are paying their way into heaven because that doesn't work. And so he nails the 95 Theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg. And as he says, while I sat and drank beer with Peter and Amsdorf, the, uh, God dealt the popery a mighty blow, namely the, the hammer strokes against the door at Wittenberg. And Martin Luther starts and kicks off the Protestant Reformation because he goes and stands before the Pope after he's arrested. The Pope says, you are going to recant these accusations against the church. Martin Luther says, I cannot, I will not recant. Here I stand, I can do no other. The Pope says, good, you're out of here. I'm excommunicating you. I ought to have you executed, you heretic. And Martin Luther launches the Protestant Reformation. 
And people began to grab onto this idea, and there becomes this schism inside of the church. You still have the Catholic Church as it exists today, obviously with lots of changes and differences. The new pope being Pope Francis, who obviously is trying to make radical reforms inside of Catholicism that a lot of us are watching with great interest. And you have Protestantism that splits off into about oh, 400 different streams. I don't know. If you're wondering, am I Catholic or Protestant, if you did not grow up going to Catholic Church... You're Protestant. So it doesn't matter whether you're Nazarene, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, uh, Anglican, uh, Church of England, uh, etc. I can go on and on and on and name them. Unless you're Greek Orthodox, which is the eastern branch of the church. And I'm not even getting into that because it gives me a headache. All right? I like history, but not that much. So a lot of, you, a lot of us would say, oh, well, great. We know the Protestant Reformation. They split off. And they started this whole new deal. That's great. Surely that opened things up. No, they just took a lot of the things that had kind of been codified and said, we don't want a pope, but we're going to keep all this other, these other ideas that have kind of come down. And a lot of you, if, particularly if you grew up going to a Lutheran church or an Episcopal church, you still get a lot of flavor of Catholicism inside of that because there's still a lot of the vestments and a lot, and the, they follow the liturgy and the catechism and all that kind of stuff. And that's because they're, they are less separated from the Catholic church than, you know, a Baptist or a Nazarene or crazy people like us. I know I'm losing some of you. You're like, okay, it's just a lot of history. I'm almost done. The problem is, is in the middle of all that. As all these different things in the Protestant Reformation are recovered, one of the things that doesn't, because the translations are still largely done by men, is we don't begin to recover a biblical view of sex, male and female. And so in the last 100 or 150 years, what has begun to happen is people begin to ask questions. When Paul writes, there's neither male nor Greek, male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, what impact does that have on the relationships between men and women? What impact does that have on the relationships of men and women inside of the church? And so this morning, what I want to do, having laid the, laid the foundation and, and truthfully admitted to you where some of, the, some of the accusations have come from, I want to go back to Scripture and I want to look at what does Jesus say about ladies? What does Jesus say about women? And so I want you to turn with me, first of all, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. Beginning in verse 10. It says, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Jesus was teaching. And there was a woman who had a disabling spirit. For 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And Jesus saw her and he called her over. And he said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath. And the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. If you're uh, reading a paper Bible, what I want you to do is I want you to look at verse 16, and I want you to underline that verse, but I want you to circle the phrase daughter of Abraham. And if you're doing it digitally, go ahead and highlight that verse for, for, for further reference. And I'll tell you why, why you're doing it. That is the only place in Scripture where you will find that phrase. It is a singular decla declaration of Jesus. And I know some of you would say, well, why is that a big deal? Why is that important? Well, there's a reason. See, the, the Jewish rulers of the day like to trace their relationships in their religion back to Abraham. And they call themselves sons of Abraham or Abraham's heirs. When Jesus uses this phrase and he speaks this phrase um, to this woman, he does something for her that no one else has done. He gives her value. 
So ladies, the first thing that I would want you to hear this morning is this. Is in the kingdom of God and following Jesus, you're valuable. And for some of you, maybe that's the first time you've ever heard that before. You're not just valuable to your husband or to your dad or to your kids or to whatever role that you fill. You're valuable to God. He sees you with worth. That you are precious and important in his sight. The significance of that means that you are valuable inside of the body of Christ. And you're not just valuable in in one or two little places. You're valuable to the whole. Your words are valuable. Your voice is valuable. Your ministries are valuable. The things that God has equipped you to do, the gifts that he has given to you, the strengths that he has given to you, are valuable. One of the things when I do premarital counseling with a couple is we sit down and we begin to talk about roles. And nobody likes to do that. And, and it's, it's funny because I bring that up and the way, the way I bring that up is I make the couple listen to two sermons uh, preached by this bombastic uh, pastor on the roles of men and women. Which is pretty interesting. Uh, and I make them listen to it and I'm like, I want you to write down all the things you agree with and all the things you don't agree with and I want you to bring it back here. We're going to talk about it next time. It's fun. Because this guy's a yeller. He's a yeller and a screamer, and, and he's just and I've got a couple couples here that have gone through that. I'm like, yes, he is. He scares me. Thank you, Jacob. I appreciate that. You still got married. Quit looking at me like that. <laughs> but here's the thing. He, he's, he's, I mean, he's harsh, all right? And it's interesting because I'll, I'll bring these couples back together, and we'll begin to talk about roles and responsibilities. And we'll begin to talk about how the thing that I like about these two, these two teachings is even though he's talking about that husbands and wives, men and women are created, that have very different roles, Inside of a marriage, the wife can't be the husband. You, can't, you physically can't do that. It's impossible. You're not a man. The, the, the husband can't be the wife. You physically can't do that. You're not a woman. But that doesn't mean that you're any less important. You're two parts of a whole. And the thing that gets me is a lot of times is I'll have these conversations with couples and, and they will immediately equate responsibilities with roles. Well, he's the husband. He's, he's supposed to do certain things. He's supposed to manage the money. And he's supposed to mow the grass. And I'm the wife, and I'm supposed to cook, and I'm supposed to take care of the kids. And on and on and on and on and on. And a lot of times I will look at this couple, and I, I, particularly if I know them really well, I will look at the husband, and I will, can I ask you a question yet? Yeah, do you know the first thing about keeping track of money? No. Why would you do that to yourself? Why would we look at you and go, you know, you really stink at finances. You should manage the household budget. Ladies, you're going to have a house full of Xbox and cars that you can't afford to make the payments on. But what? And I'll look at the wife a lot of times and go, can you cook? Nope. I can make macaroni and cheese out of a box. Do you know how many fellas that I've talked to that like to cook? It's fantastic. And we get these things all mixed up as if somehow or another... A woman is only supposed to be able to do certain things, and that's what her value is defined by. And a man is only supposed to be able to do certain things, and that's what his value is defined by. That is not the case. You are valued because God has declared you valuable, and he has declared your gifts valuable. And so what you bring to your marriage, what you bring to your friendships, what you bring to your relationship, what you bring to the church is valuable because God said, this person will do these things, and they will be valuable. This daughter of Abraham... Is as valuable as this son of Abraham inside the walls of my church. And by mine, I mean God's church. And so ladies, I want you to hear that this morning. You're valuable. Some of you fellows are sitting there going, I've been struggling to do the finances for like 30 years. You mean I can go home and look at her and go, you can do Excel, it's all yours, here you go. Yeah, Maybe. What, we really, what you, some of you really should do is you should, some of us should go home and look at our wives and go, you know what, for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, you've worked and done all these things, and I don't know that I've ever even stopped and said thank you before, much less communicated that what you do has a value.
Then I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 28. And the reason I want you to go back there, I'm not going to reread it because we've already read it, but I want you to stop and think about what was Jesus asking these ladies to do? He was asking them to bear witness to the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. We get all bent out of shape a lot of times inside of the church. We start talking about role. What's this role? What, is this role more important than this role? Is standing up and teaching more important than leading music? Is teaching the little kids more important than teaching the youth? Is, is, is greeting at the door on Sunday morning more important than driving the van so somebody can get somewhere? Is taking somebody food more or less important than fixing somebody's car? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on and on. Ladies, can I tell you what your role is inside of the church? It's the same as the guys. Your role is to tell other people about Jesus. You know, we do our best not to emphasize, do a whole lot of emphasis on titles inside of this church. There's some specific and non-specific reasons for that. A lot of it is because I just get really uncomfortable when people start going, well, he's the pastor, he's this, he's that. We don't even have a lead pastor. We have all kinds of different roles. But we all have one role. And that role is to tell people about who Jesus is using the gifts and skills that God has given to us. I'm not concerned with whether you get, you're a pastor and somehow you get paid to do it or whether you are the janitor and you don't get paid to do anything other than clean up. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that's what God created you to do. When he saved you from your sin, he didn't go, now you are going to be a less significant part of the church because you are going to be responsible for teaching women's Bible study. Oh, woe is you. Sorry, Shelley. He doesn't know what he said. He said, you're called to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's your role. And how that works out inside the physical walls of a local church is going to be different everywhere. We can go across the street, literally go across the street and find a church where there are different things that people are doing to tell people about Jesus. We can go down the block and find four churches on four corners and every single one of them is doing something different to tell people about Jesus. And you know what's really crucial? Is that the people that are really truthfully doing it, they don't care whether they're men or women. What they care about is are you talking to someone about your relationship with Christ? There's no delineation. If you have value, if Jesus has said you have value, then there's no reason for you to go, well, that's the role. I don't know if I like that role. I'd like a more prominent role or a more important role. But based on whose standards? Because the only standard I find in Scripture is Jesus saying, all of you, as he speaks to all of the disciples, go, tell people about me. And the first people who he gives that commandment to are women. So you must be a big deal inside of the making known of Jesus. I have friends that serve in in an unnamed country where Islam is the religion. Do you know who the most powerful evangelists are in that country? It's not my buddy. It's his wife. Do you want to know why? The most open people to hearing about the gospel are the women. Because they are oppressed and abused and treated as property. And they hear the gospel of freedom and of hope. And they hear it. They couldn't hear it from a guy. If they were caught sitting and listening to a guy teach that wasn't their husband or the imam, they could be killed on the spot. So you know who they hear it from? His wife. You know why? Because she has the freedom to talk to them. There are places in our world where a guy can't go. Ladies, you're the pastor there. You're the preacher there. You're the witness there. That's your role. There's one other thing I want you to look at. 
And it's over in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. And then we're going to come to some conclusions. In Luke chapter 8, it says, soon afterward, he, in verse 1, soon afterward he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. I know it seems like a really simple little insignificant passage until you stop and think about what the, what the rabbinical schools were like inside the first century. People who were the disciples of a rabbi did something. They followed him. It's the one thing Rob Bell ever got right. He talked about being covered in the dust of their rabbi. He's exactly right. That is a description of a disciple. A disciple walked, wanted to walk so close to their rabbi that as he walked and kicked up dust with his feet, they wanted to be covered in the front in the dust of their rabbi. Well, here's Jesus going with his disciples and going out through the cities and villages. And who's traveling with him? The twelve. It identifies the twelve. And there were twelve guys. And Mary and Joanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. What? Yes. There was this group of women who was walking around with the disciples, with Jesus, who were saying, hey, we can pay for that. We can cover that. We can take care of that. They were providing for Jesus out of their means. You know what we call those people in the first century? We call them disciples. Your position is value, ladies. Your role is witness. What's your standing? You're a disciple. Can I tell you something really interesting? There's not a way to translate this disciple s. I can't fancy it up for you. There's a masculine and a feminine because that's the, that's the Greek way of identifying a woman or a man when they're talking about it in that fashion. But there's not a disciple s. It's the same word. It's translated the same way consistently both inside and outside of Scripture. It's a place of equal standing before the Father. You're a disciple. So what does that mean for the church? Well, the first thing is this. Is we as the church, we can recognize that God did create male and female. It is an intended distinction. There's nothing wrong with being a man. There's nothing wrong with being a woman. It's the way God made you to be. But it's not somehow another a greater or lesser. It's how God made you. He didn't make a mistake. The second thing is this, is we need to begin to define ourselves by how God's gifted us and not how the world defines us. See, inside of our culture, the really easy thing to do would be go, well, the, the culture says this. We should just adopt all these things in. We should just do what the culture does. We should do what the world does. You can do that, but you realize that if you do that, it's going to change from country to country that you go to. You can go to uh, Saudi Arabia and have a very different experience defining how you're supposed to act as a follower of Jesus by what the culture does. You can head over to China and you can have another completely different experience. You can go to Russia and have a different experience. You can go to Switzerland and have a different experience. Germany, you can have a different experience. Brazil, very different experience. Or you can say, okay, what Scripture says about me as a man, about me as a woman, is consistent. And I'll be really honest with you, I would prefer... That we define ourselves by the way God's defined us. And I think as a follower of Jesus, I would say we have no other option unless we just want to take this and toss it out. And so we begin to define ourselves by how God has gifted us and not by how the world sees us. 
That means, fellas, that means that our, our, the women that are around us, they're not objects. They're not objects of our lust. They're not objects for us to dominate. They're not objects for us to boss around. They're not objects for us to abuse. They are people created in the same image of God that we have been created in. Ladies, that means that there's not a, there's not a war that is being fought against you. That means that God's not saying they're going, yeah, go, subjugate those women, treat them like garbage. God is for you. He sees you as valuable and he loves you. The third thing I would say within the church is that we celebrate the differences between men and women. We celebrate the fact that women can do ministry that men can't even begin to touch. Men can do ministry that women can't even begin to touch. And that we mutually affirm one another and our worth and the plan that God has for our lives. And there's not only not anything wrong with that, there's something inherently right about that. Because God didn't make us the same. Thank goodness. I mean, seriously. Would you want to be married, to, fellas, to somebody who looks like me? No, not going to do it. But it's not just about looks. It's about equipping. Would you really want somebody who was just like you? If the church was filled with people who were just like Hank? Just like Lindy, just like Shelly, just like Bart. I can just go through and name names. Everybody's created and built differently. We celebrate those differences. We, we realize that they're, they're, those people have worth. And they're made that way for a reason. And so what we need to do is we need to begin to advocate for the, for the biblical position of women being treated as people and creations of God in a world that's increasingly hostile to them. I know some of you would immediately hear that and say, oh no, the world's not increasingly hostile to women. We have a woman that's going to be nominated as president. So it's the time of the smashing of the glass ceilings. You know what, you're right. We had a woman nominated as president. We also have more and more women sold into sex slavery now than there existed at the time of the African slave trade. We have more and more women being exploited through pornography than we've ever had in the history of the world. We have more and more women whose rights are being systematically taken away from across the world now than has ever existed. We have women being brutalized and beaten. We have women being assaulted, taken advantage of. We have more and more of a world where the, the message to a woman is, be a man. Why? What's wrong with being a woman? That's stronger in some cases than being a man. We have a world that's trying to, constantly trying to tear down that there's any difference whatsoever between men and women. And at the same time, women go, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a woman, not a guy. We have more and more women that are saying to themselves, there's, I can't find anybody even worth spending time with because everybody I talk to is, is just like they treat me like I'm some person on a screen and not like a real human being. And you know who should lead the charge against that? The church. You know why? Because our God created women and he said that they had value. And he said that they had a role and he said that they had a purpose. He said they were important. I'm a dad of four daughters. I love women. I'm thankful that God created women in his image in the same way that he created men. And I would say to you that I honestly say the history of the church and this issue is broken. But just because the history of a group of people who are trying to follow scripture is broken doesn't mean that God is broken. And it doesn't mean that God's word isn't valid. And it doesn't mean that there's not importance that's found there. So ladies that are here this morning, I would say this to you. Your value is found first and foremost in your relationship with God. And that is found through a relationship with Jesus. You will begin to see yourself differently when you see a Savior. Not some husband out there riding on a white horse to fix your life. Not a dad who was a good dad instead of a bad dad. Not a son or a daughter that somehow or another validates your existence. But when you see a Savior who came and died for your sins in the same way that he died for the sins of men. 
who says to you, come, let me show you a different way. And so there are some of you ladies and some of you men that are here this morning that you don't need to go out and try to fix relationships. You need a relationship with a Savior. You need to come to a God who says, bring me your sin. I will forgive your sin and I will place my righteousness on you. I will change your life. I will take you from death to life. For some of you this morning, that's what you need to do. You need to ask Jesus to save you from your sin. So here in a couple minutes, we're going to have a, a time of response, a time of invitation. Danny and the band are going to start coming up. And during that time, if you need to ask questions about that, talk to somebody about that, there will be men and women at the back that would love to visit with you about what it means to follow Jesus. Were well, there are others of you that are in here this morning? Now, there are different things that are going on. Ladies, for some of you, maybe it's the very first time you've ever heard that God sees you as valuable. Maybe you need to spend some time this morning with God dealing with the fact that you've never come to the realization of the group of that. Maybe you've never believed it before. Fellas, maybe there are some of you that are here this morning that you, your vision of you, of your wife, of your mom, your kids, of women in general has been so broken and so fractured by culture. And this morning, as you begin to hear what God's word says about women, you're like, okay, I am really missed the boat. And this morning needs to be a time of repentance for you. And so if, if you would like to come and pray, this, I realize I don't have cool padded prayer rails or anything like that. You're welcome to come up here and pray. You can pray in your seat. If you need to talk to somebody, we'll be at the back. Maybe you need to grab somebody that's here that you know you've wronged and you need to have a visit and a conversation with them. I would just invite you guys to stand. I'm going to pray. And I would ask you to respond. Father, this is one, another one of those subjects that's so hard to talk about. It's so hard to put into words. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that it seems so foreign or alien to talk about somehow or another the idea that you would create something that didn't have value, that wasn't important. And yet God, having been inside of your church as a, as a pastor in some role for over 20 years, I know I've talked to countless women who've been hurt and been broken by the church. And God, I thank you for the truths of your word the value that you place on men and women. The prominence that both have in your kingdom. Of the usefulness that both have in your kingdom. Father, I pray this morning that there would be, there would be repentance. I pray for men and women this morning who need a savior. That they would respond to you this morning by confessing their sins and asking you to save them from their sins. Rather give them the courage to come back and talk to somebody about that decision, about what they're walking through. Father, I pray this morning for men and women that are in this room that they, they have, they've been hurt. And today's message is a soothing balm or it's a, it's a hard poke in the side saying, you've really, really, really got this wrong. I do, I pray for repentance, Father. I pray for your church. Not just this church gathering in Yukon, but the church all across the world, that as more and more we see the oppression and the objectification and the, uh, just the, the, the ruining of, of women, that we would stand against that. That we would lend our voices to the cause. Not for the sake of political means, not for the sake of some secular agenda, but for the sake of the gospel. For the value of women that you created in your image. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
You guys have a seat for a couple minutes. We've got a couple announcements, and then uh, we will pray, and then we'll be done. If we can get the lights turned on. Okay. Um, first of all, we have a video here in a minute. I do want to just say something really quick um, about, about the value of women, and especially in the context of Mission OK. At Britain Courtyard, you guys know Mission OK is a ministry where we target um, low-income apartment complexes. We really kind of what, what I like to say is we're trying to find like the most dangerous place we can find, and we put the gospel right in the middle of it. And so, um, but you know, I hold the credit card that buys all the food. Um, I have the key to the apartment. Um, I'm the one that's supposed to, you know, I've got the relationship with the apartment manager to actually get us the apartment. If flyers need to be handed out, I get them over there and, and try and get them handed out. But guess who has the biggest impact when it comes to Britain Courtyard? It's not my, it's not myself. It's my wife, and it's Amy. Because when you show up there, even though I do all that supposedly important stuff that comes with the title and all that, when we get there and we walk through the apartment complex, guess who they all run to? They run to my wife, and they run to Amy. And um, this last week, we actually picked up a couple of our students and brought them over to the house to go swimming at, at our neighborhood pool. Um, it was really kind of an interesting exchange because there were some kids at the pools talking to two of our students and were like, who are you guys? Because they obviously didn't fit. I mean, they obviously, you know, weren't, didn't have the appearance of being from the neighborhood. And, uh, and they turned around to put in my wife and go, we're with her. And they said, well, who is she? And they, they said, she's kind of like our mom. That's the impact that the women who work in Mission OK have at Britain Courtyard and at Wentwood because they can do what I can't. They can do what Brent can't. They can do what Jeremy can't. Now, Jeremy's known as the fun guy because he's got the parachute. He's got all the fun stuff. But when it comes to relationship, when it comes to um, the gospel being put at the core of their being, it's my wife and Amy and, and Catherine and the other ladies that work there that are really able uh, to do that. So, just kind of a side note. Um, the Seven Marriages Bible Study. We have a video for that? You guys watch this real quick and we'll talk about that.
throughout our marriage, we have experienced a lot. We have been through financial challenges, through in-law challenges, through intimacy and communication challenges. We've even been homeless. But through it all, our marriage has lasted, and primarily because we have stood by one thing and one thing in particular, and that is the Word of God. One of the biggest challenges that we all have in our marriage is going through trials, going through challenges that cause us to lose hope. Some of you, life was easy and things were going well, and then you got married, and then all of a sudden it seems like these trials, these challenges, these things that you faced that you had never faced before came about. God is allowing us to go through these things individually and as a couple to bring out something great in us. There's a cornerstone to our marriages that we need to build from, and that cornerstone is our relationship with Jesus Christ. We've created the Seven Rings of Marriage, which is going to be a guide for you and for couples who desire to have a God-fulfilling marriage. I think this is our number one request for prayer in our church. Just pray for my family, pray for my wife and I. So it doesn't matter how your relationship with your spouse stands right now. I'll tell you, if it's good, it's going to get bad. If it's bad, God can make it good again. It doesn't matter where your status is with your relationship right now. You need this Bible study. Um, in the back of the room, on one of the billboards, there is a sign-up sheet for it. Uh, regardless, we, we're, we're not exactly sure of when we're going to have it yet. We're trying to find out when the best time is for everyone to have the Bible study. If you're interested, we're not asking you to commit right now to be there all eight weeks. We're saying if you're interested in being a part of the Bible study, please, after the service, go in the back room, just write your name, your, uh, your phone number, and I think there's a place on there for a time that might be best for you, and just let us know so that we can get the organized. We're hoping to start that uh, this fall. And then Shelly, she's right down the front row holding the baby. She's always got a baby in her hands. That's so. right. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely know my role on Sunday, and that's putting people to sleep. Uh, Amanda gives me Libby, and I put her right to sleep. So stay awake while I'm talking right now. We want to thank all the people that are um, here visiting us. We have George and Charlotte in the back. Move your hands. We have Tim. And Tim, why? I was talking to you so much I forgot your name. Teresa? Kristen. See, I can't even hear. And then we have my cousin. I just wanted to shout out to, to my cousin Larry's here visiting us. And then if we had an award for the person who traveled the farthest today, it would be for the man sitting next to him. Cole? Cole came from West Virg Virginia. Virginia, sorry, not West Virginia. So <laughs> make sure you make him feel welcome. Another thing I'd like to announce is we know that Jamie and Steve are getting married in two weeks. Jamie, Steve, why don't you come up here? Uh, we are so blessed that they're both here and in our church, and we're so excited about your union. Um, I know that you guys have been going through counseling with Amy and Brant, and we're so excited. We'd like to end with prayer, but then right after the prayer, Jamie, we are going to switch you off. As Steve has already said, he'll take care of the kids, and we're going to take you to a surprise bridal shower. So we're going to go to Louie's. Those of you that are coming with us, it's Louie's on Garth Brooks. Amanda and Catherine are already there with our tables waiting. And so let's just pray right now for the year marriage. You want me to? Is it okay for me to do it? Is, is it my role? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. 